Hi there, guys. I appreciate it again just the opportunity to speak to you and share some truth again into your context with your uh, Canadian equip. I do trust it's going really well together, and those of you are able to get together, enjoying your fellowship and friendship, and uh, yeah, just strategic moments and times that we're living in, and I certainly don't take lightly just the opportunity to share into your context. So hope you'll open your hearts with me again and uh, get some scripture back in us, but also be able to adjust. I'm just so amazed how often God hi- or Jesus highlights in his teachings in the Gospels how very few would actually do what he says. They're very good at hearing but not doing. And we know what that looks like. We certainly know what he goes on to say. It looks like it's like building a house. Matthew 7, he says that. And in Luke chapter 6, uh, it's like building a house on the sand if you don't listen. And uh, if you don't, don't go do it. Those who hear my words and put them into practice, he says, is like a foolish man, a, a wise man who puts it, who builds his house upon the rock. And when the storms come, the, ha- the house stands strong. But anyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't put them into practice, he says, is like a foolish man who builds his house upon the sand. And when the storms come, the house crashes. And friends, that's what we're seeing today, if we're honest. There's a whole lot of crashing and a whole lot of falling down of maybe things we've all given our lives to or others have in it possibly because we haven't built according to the rock on the foundation of the rock and that revelation being Jesus. So let's not just be hearers, let's be doers, let's build accordingly, let's be challenged. I'm hoping this session to be a little more practical and to challenge us about something of the shape of the future church or the church to come. I think we're all asking those questions right now. What does the future look like and what does it look like to build for the next era uh, or or the next season and long term. And we don't want to just put things in place for the next few years or weeks. God is a generational God, a God of generations. He's a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We think in weeks, months, and years, and that's good. But we need to think beyond our generation into more generations, next generations. And I think Jesus is coming back soon. I keep saying that. I believe that under my watch, He will return. If I'm wrong, it doesn't matter. If I'm right, it does matter. We build accordingly. But... In saying that, I may be wrong. We want to plan accordingly and build for the next 50 to 100, 150 years. And so the question's been asked, like, what is the shape? Someone recently asked me to preach into their context about the shape of the church to come. And and I find that a fascinating subject. I want to be careful and say it's very dangerous to try and shape something of the future because if we can so worry about the shape, we can miss the moments and the things God's called us to. And so... I want to highlight in light of that, in light of the first session that I talked about, the the three things happening and our four responses, I want to talk this session about the shape of the church. If you've got a Bible, go with me to the book of Psalms, Psalm 32. And uh, in 2020, the beginning of 2020, God really spoke to me and I felt it was a season of release. I felt God say we're entering into a season of release. And to be honest, I had no idea what that meant. I certainly did not perceive any of what we've gone through. For me, it was more about God backing what we're doing and we're going to have more of His release. And and then like uh, I began to preach that in January of 2020 and February. I was in Australia preaching all over and got back in the end of February and have not left our country since. It's like we went from that into a lockdown and a shutdown And it was almost like, well, how's this a release when we're all locked up and locked down and shut down and can't do what we were supposed to be doing? And But looking back in hindsight in the last 12 to 18 months or so, I want to tell you we have been released. There's been a lot of release. God has released us from things that perhaps we were so busy with and just carrying on with, certainly in my own life, in our own ministries, in our local churches and so on. He has released us, but He's released us from I believe, in order to release us into. And so it was a season of release. It has been a season of release. I feel like we're into a new season now that we've been released from in order to release us into more and into the new and the next. But in saying that, I also feel like it's a season of effectiveness. We've got to be effective and look for effective ways and not just kind of business as usual. I keep saying the moment we've been in has not paused the mission that we've been on. God didn't stop what He's doing in this pandemic. He paused again what we were doing in order to remind us what He's doing and also to show us that apart from Him, we can't do anything, which we talked about last session. And I've said this in the last session, but destiny is often revealed way more in seasons of crisis and confrontation than it is in convenience and in comfort. And so we perhaps had convenience and comfort before, but 
what we've gone through has revealed greater destiny. And I talked a bit about the, the uh, purposes of God and the power of purpose and the hope to which we've been called last session. This session, I want to talk about the shape of the church and what we need to give ourselves to. Psalm 32, very, very great. I love this scripture. In verse 8 and 9, we're going to read, but I want to read it from the, the, the Passion Translation. And I know you might all be offended by that, but I just love the way uh, it's just kind of written and it really makes sense. It makes the point of what I'm trying to say to you guys today. So Psalm 32 verse 8, it says, I hear the Lord saying, I'll stay close to you, instructing and guiding you along the pathway for your life. I'll advise you along the way and lead you forth with my eyes as your guide. <laughs> Man, this is such been a, such a key text of ministering to me in this pandemic through the season. I mean, we've all had to face stuff for our own lives, but even for ministry and for the stuff we're doing around the world. And there's no books that I can read. There's no people I can call and say, hey, have you done this before? You know, even calling my dad, which I do regularly to ask him perspective. He's been great at that. But he's also said, Darren, I've never led NCMI through season like this. And it's true. And it's not that we can't learn from history, but we got to go to God. And it's God guiding us, God revealing, God showing. We may get some things wrong at times, and that's okay, I think. But as long as we go to God and realize He's got our destiny, He's control, He is watching over our lives and guiding us and leading us. And that's awesome. It gives me courage. I hope it does you, regardless of what you're facing, whatever you're involved in. But the challenge actually is in verse 9, uh, and he says this, So don't make it difficult. Don't be stubborn when I take you where you've not been before. Don't make me tug you and pull you along. Just come with me. So he's, I'll advise you, I'll lead you, I'll guide you, I'll take hold of you, I'll, I'll show you my eye watching over you and your future. That I, But then he says, that's what I'm doing, but don't make it hard for me. Don't make me force you and struggle and just come with me. And our friends, I feel like going forward, we just need to go with him. Maybe it means letting go of some of the stuff. It Maybe it means learning to trust him again. Maybe we've trusted people and it's gone wrong for us, perhaps. I don't know. But, but I just feel like in all of the future that he has for us to, to, to build the church with the shape of the future he intends for us, it requires us to come back to trusting, obeying, listening, and not making it hard for him as he leads us. Just go with him. In saying that, I, I do think that maybe some of you watching go, Chia, I love that. I'm just all about the next and whatever. And, but there's a danger in that, friends, that we, we better settle what we are called to because those things are not up for debate. And, and the danger in a season like this, shaping and reshaping something of the future of the church, is that we're quick to dismiss or get rid of things we don't like anymore, or perhaps things we think are irrelevant, or maybe they're things we haven't settled what really matters. And if we haven't settled those, we're in danger of giving it all up in trying to be this future church. And so I'm going to be that voice, if I can, today, to just highlight some of the things that should not change, that are not up for change, that don't need to change. They need to be the kind of the, almost the anchors to which we hold to in order to be the church going forward and then allow some of those other things to change going forward. The ways we do things have to change, but not necessarily. You know, a lot of people are asking questions like how and when. And I, I could probably you in Canada are asking us questions more than us because how are we going to do this and when are things going to open up again? And those are big questions and they matter, but they're probably the wrong questions because those things are not in your hands. And uh, the more you ask that and the more it's, it's going to probably bring you to a place of being disillusioned because how and when are so changeable. But we should come back to the questions of rather the who and the what. And the who and the what doesn't change. And so I keep saying things like, we've got to stick to God's plan if we want to walk in God's purpose. And so that's what I want to highlight with you guys today, is we've got to stick to the plans of God if we're serious about the purposes of God. If we're just about our plans and our purposes, well then do whatever, say whatever, embrace whatever. But if we're serious about His plans and that, then we've got to stick to His purpose and plans. So ask rather who and what. So, so highlighting, we, we've got to be a people of purpose in this season and vision. Um, I, I, the Bible says, you know, in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. We know that. We quote that. 
Uh, one of the other versions say, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Um, one of the other versions actually say, without revelation, people run wild. <laughs> and we want wildness, but we don't want to be running wild in a season of open spaces and doors and the future church. We, we want to come back to true vision, true purpose. You know, what I've realized, if people don't know where they're supposed to be going, they end up going everywhere except where they should be going. And so just come back to this thing of vision. We need to be envisioning people. We need purpose and vision. We're not going to just find a way. We've got to present the future God has for us. We've got to keep speaking it. It's not changing regardless of seasons and situations. What we've been called to has not changed, cannot change. And so we need purpose and we need to be a people of vision. There's a big difference between vision and strategy. And I think that's important for us going forward and shaping the church, the future of the church, is that strategy must change, can change, but vision doesn't. But many of us present vision as strategy or strategy as vision. And so when we change strategy, people think we change in vision. We can't change vision. There's one vision that's given by God, but our strategy must change. And so let's not present goals as vision. Let's not present this is what we're going to have, 100 church plants by the end of that. No, no, no. Those are strategies to fulfill the vision of knowing Christ and making Him known. So I hope that makes sense. We've got to adjust not our purpose and vision. We've got to adjust our strategy in order to fulfill the vision. It gives us opportunity to risk more going forward into a season that God has. You know, I've found also that people lose their way when they lose their why. And so vision is more about where and why, and strategy is more about how and what. And I think those are things we're working through. So number one, obviously, we need to learn, lead, and be a people of vision, purpose, and st- Secondly, we need to stay prophetic, which we've spoken of many times. But, you know, we've, we, we've kind of boiled prophetic being down to simply three things. To see the future, which again links to vision and purpose. To, to prepare for the future and to become the future. And so, even as we dream about the shape of the future of the church, we need to see what God's called us to. We need to be preparing and I think COVID has, or this lockdown and pandemic has forced us to prepare ourselves again. But guys, we also got to be coming. We can't just dream of something. We've got to be coming. And so it does mean in a season like this, we are being prophetic. We need to read the seasons. We need to read and know what to do in the seasons. And, and I think our problem is that we're so good at seeing what others are doing. And so we're just embracing it rather than what God's telling us. And so I just want to challenge you not to... Ignore what others are doing, but be careful we're not just trying to implement other people's revelation. We've got to hear God in the season. I've got some thoughts and strategies too, but you've got to hear God for you. And there are things that He's called us to do together, but there's also things you've got to hear for, for yourself. So just be prophetic. And I was thinking uh, today, that this morning, you know, my mother-in-law, uh, she lives interstate, and uh, she, she loves to visit, obviously, Nicole and... Uh, she does come up from time to time and stay with us and so on. But it's interesting that when she's here with us or with Nicole, she spends most of the time talking about the next visit. Uh, and I love that we sh- need a plan, but she's almost like so determined about when do we see you next that you're not enjoying the moments you're in now. And I feel like for us, guys, maybe all of us just want to get out of the season, get into the next. And that's good. And I understand that we've got to be a prophetic people. But don't miss the moment we're in, the stuff that God's showing now. God wastes no season. Every season matters. And uh, so while we focused on the future, don't miss what He's doing in the now in order to help us fulfill the future. Um, and I've been reading through, and it's another preach somewhere else, and maybe someday I'll get to preach it with you. But even in the season of being effective, we've been released from in order to be released into, but we need to be a, a, effective in our season. I've been looking at truths again. When Paul writes in Colossians chapter four seventeen, he says, "See to it that Ar- be sure to tell Archippus to see to it that he f- finishes or completes the task he's been given by the Lord." Like, see, what does that mean? Well, that's interesting. And Paul in Acts twenty, when he calls the elders um, of Ephesus together, and he's like offloading revelation, knowing he's going, and and then he says to them. I, 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 uh, all I know is that compelled by the Spirit, I- I'm going to Jerusalem. I don't know what waits for me there, except I know hardship and prison. But then he says something incredibly interesting. He says, however, I consider my life worth nothing. But he doesn't say my life's worth nothing. He said my nothing to me. Your life matters. That's why Jesus came. And your wi- he, what he, we need to come to is my life means nothing to me. It means everything to him. 
And certainly when we're in his purposes, that's what Paul was talking about. But he says, if only I may finish the race and complete the task to which the, the, the task that he's given me, which is to testify uh, the grace of God to the world. Uh, basically, what, what I want to say is this, that I've been a huge believer on preaching and how, finishing our race, and it's important and it's very key that all of us run our race, finish it, and aim for the end result of crossing that line. But I, do, I think I've often and I've very seldom ever heard anyone talk about completing the task as a different thing. You, if you just finish, focus on ending your finishing your race, all you care about is getting to the end. Well, then I'm not sure we focused on completing the task because we just want to cross the line at the finish. They're two different things. And I think we've got to obviously aim to finish the race. But I want to challenge us. We've got to get better at completing the task that God's given us. And I think that's what it means to be prophetic. We're not so focused on the next season, the shape of the future church to come, that we ignore the stuff He's given us pre-COVID to finish well in. So I want to just say to you and I, let's do better at not just finishing the race, but also completing the God-given tasks that He's given us. We've got to be good finishers, uh, the race and good completers of the task. Um, and whatever that means for you and for me and and so the challenge is, let's get better at completing the task. And then he goes on to the elders and he says, keep watch over yourselves, which is a great truth of, I think, finishing your race. If you're going to finish your race, you've got to keep watch over yourself. But he also says, and the flock to which the Holy Spirit has called you overseer. I think that the, the work you do is more about completing the task. The race you're running is more about Keep in watch of yourself. So hopefully that makes sense. But let's be prophetic in the season and not just be so quick to the next thing that we're missing completing the thing God has for us now. Thirdly, we need to keep pioneering. Keep pioneering. And I talked a little about that in the last session about taking ground, Isaiah 50, or stretching, pioneering, and so on. But we need to keep taking ground, not holding ground. So so just, uh, again, practical, simple things, not new at all, but just in our dreaming and reshaping and shaping something of the future church what must not change what does not change what won't change in any of this well first and foremost obviously our master jesus christ will never change and we have quoted hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 jesus christ is the same yesterday today and forevermore that's been probably one of the most quoted scriptures in our togetherness but I kind of feel like that's become a reality, not just a quoted scripture. That in all change that has happened, even in the last 12 to 18 months, everything has changed. Every, nothing's the same anymore, except we have this guarantee Jesus Christ is. So if we're going to seriously fulfill the mission He has for us and be the church that He's setting up for the next era, I'm not saying era because error, I'm era, I'm emphasizing era, the next however many years. We've got to put our anchor into the unchanging one and we've got to talk about the unchanging one and we've got to make sure that He doesn't change. We change to become more like Him. He's not changing to become more like us. Jesus is the Lord of the church. We know that. He's the Lord. Therefore, we to obey Him completely. He is the leader of the church. You and I are not. We have a role to play in helping Him lead His people, but He's the leader. Saying this then, we're to be following Him, not following us. Saying this then, is we're to be more like our leader, Christ, than our leaders who lead us here on earth. But Jesus is the true leader of the church. We're to follow Him totally. Jesus is the lover of the church, which means we should adore Him supremely. He's the life of the church, which means we need to continue to get to know Him personally, which I talked about last session. He is our strength. He is going to be the sustaining one for the future church. Without Him, we don't have anything. And so this got to be set in stone, grounded in us, got to keep coming back to this truth. He's our strength. He's our source. He's our Savior. He's the life and truth that supports and sustains us. You know, He has assumed the responsibility for carrying us safely into the future. And He's secured our victory for all eternity. So we say this many times, the Lord of the work is way more important than the work of the Lord. Therefore, He cannot change, must not change. And that's got to be the thing we keep coming back to. The question is this, are we governed by His work or are we governed by Him? It better be Him because His work changes, but He doesn't. So stating obvious, what doesn't change is obviously our master revelation, the Lord. Secondly, what doesn't change, what is not up for change is our message. 
I'm amazed how people have changed their message. And, and guys, I understand we've got to be more creative in how to present truth, but our message hasn't changed. In actual fact, this, this uh, pandemic has forced you and I to come back to what really matters and what message should we be preaching and what message have we been preaching because that which is fallen is not kingdom. We've said that. The kingdom cannot be shaken. Therefore, the stuff that has been shaken is because it's not kingdom. So our, our message will not change, must not change, and it's not up for debate. And that is the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 24, Jesus talks about end times and all these things that will happen, uh, that will be the birth pains and the beginning of the end, he says. And then in Matthew 24, verse 14, he says, And this gospel of the kingdom, Note, not your latest revelation, not the church's revelation, not your preaching of your church or your mission. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So remember that our gospel of the kingdom is the message we've been given. And if we've been preaching anything else, can I ask you, please come back to this and make sure this is the focus. Everything fits around this truth, this truth, the, these, this message. It's this message we've been given. And so the future of the, the shape of the church going forward has to be a church that is absolutely convinced this message is good enough. The gospel is good enough. It's good enough to save people in any context, any region, any time, through COVID, out of COVID, whatever we face. Uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation, right? So our message is the gospel of the kingdom. Don't forget what we win people with is what we win people to. And we've seen people fall away in the season. I think it's because we're winning them with the wrong thing. We need to win them with the gospel of the kingdom so they stay the course regardless of what comes our way. And let me just say too, the aim of the gospel is not to get men to heaven. It's to return them back to God. That's what matters. It's not just about getting to heaven. It's God's desire for men and women to be returned back to Him the way He created us in the original intention through the, in the book of Genesis in creation. All right, so stating the obvious again, but our message does not change. Thirdly, our mission. Our mission is to the whole world. I don't know what to say, and I know you're in lockdown and shutdown. You might be feeling like, geez, we just love to get to our community, get to our malls, get to... But in saying all those realities, we have a mission, and it's global, it's the whole world, and that will never change. And if that changes, then the future of the church and the shape of the church will be misrepresenting what God's called us to. This mission is global, and we've got to be good with the cities we're in, we've got to be reaching the communities we're in, but we also have to have a heart for the whole world. And that's what we read, Matthew 24, 20, uh, 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached as in the whole world, the whole world, that's every ethnos, every people group around the world. That's our call, friends. And so however the shape looks for the church going forward, it better include mission is global. We're not about our local. We're not just about our region. We're about the whole world because God is about the whole world. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus said you receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes on, me, on you and you'll be witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts of the earth, right? It's simultaneous. It's not get one right, get the second, get the third, and then we'll do the world thing. It's all together, our call. And, uh, you know, we realize in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, that they were so good at reaching Jerusalem, but they neglected their global inheritance and outside of the walls, that God brought persecution, allowed persecution, because He was committed. He wants this gospel global. And so I just want to say, let's respond to Acts chapter 1 verse 8 by living it out rather than God having to force another Acts chapter 8 verse 1 on us. Let's do it out of call rather than out of Him forcing His will and His way. So again, guys, stating obvious. Someone said, if the world is not your parish, well, then your parish will become your world. And that's such a concern for the future church that we don't just make our church our world. We've got the world there waiting for this. I do think our, our mission is adaptable to be more effective through crisis, but it's not to change at all. It's the whole world. The next stating the obvious point is what doesn't change is our mandate. The mandate given by God is to make disciples. I, it's obvious, but Jesus was very clear. His last words to us were to go and make disciples. Jesus in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now go 
and make disciples, followers of Jesus, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and teaching them to obey. And surely I'm with you always to the end of age. Those were Jesus' last words to his people. Friends, I don't want to like pull at your emotional strings this today, but I want to challenge you. If you claim to love Christ, if it's Jesus obsessed and focused, then I want to tell you we better get on with what Jesus told us to do. And he called us to make disciples. He called us as a follower of Christ to make followers of Christ. All our ministries, all our involvement must always have this end result to see people become more like Jesus. We say this, we believe this, but are we living this? And the future church has to embrace this truth. If that's his last words, those are our first work. Uh, Someone said a decision may get you to heaven, but a disciple gets others there with you. And we don't just want decisions, we want disciples. So go and be a disciple, go and make disciples. And I think one of the most tragic things I read recently, and I know it was a 2018 uh, survey of churchgoers in North America, and uh, they, they asked thousands of believers, churchgoers, this question, how many of you know about the Great Commission? And there was all these statistics. But the troubling one is 51% of churchgoers in 2018 in North America have never heard about the Great Commission. Now, I don't know what that does to you. And I know it's a statistic, and I know it was a few years back. But friends, there's a problem if more than half of the churchgoers in North America have never heard about the Great Commission. It tells me, number one, that pastors and preachers are not aiming for what Jesus left for us to do. And even more troubling, maybe, is that people aren't reading their Bibles because you cannot read through Scripture, not even the New Testament, the Old and New together, and see that Jesus has left us this mandate. And so we're going to have to contend and we're going to have to not presume and be way more intentional about being disciple makers and sticking to the mandate and not getting busy with ministry, keeping the main thing the main thing Making disciples is what Jesus called us. The next point is what doesn't change is the means. And I'm just sticking with, with alliteration, the M's. But the means, the vehicle uh, through which uh, the kingdom comes, being the church. The church is adaptable and changeable and all these things. I get that and we've got to be. And maybe that's where we've gone wrong in past is we've all had to try and be the same and do the same. But actually, this vehicle isn't changing. And for the shape of the future church means it's through the church. We need to come back and understand Jesus is building his church. If that's what he's building, it matters, and he's not doing away from it. And maybe you just listening and watching saying, Tia, we don't need the church anymore. We've actually found not even being in the church anymore. It's easier to just get on. I listen to kingdom people talk about no need for church. Nowhere in Scripture can you find that. In actual fact, we need to operate through the church, because Jesus is building his church. We don't make the church the focus, but we realize the church is the vehicle. That can't change in our dreaming for this future that God has for us, friends. Jesus is building his church, Matthew 16, and he's given us this mission to go make disciples. But he is the builder of the church. He's the master. He's the Lord of the church. This vehicle does not change. He's not going to find another way. It's his church through his church. You know, the church is not the center of God's plan. Jesus is. But the church is central to God's plan. And will always be, even whatever we look to the future to shape the church, it's going to be that. And I I do want to just challenge us as the church and say this. We need to view ourselves as Jesus did. And what I mean by that is the church is the agent of God's mission. We're, We're not the goal of God's mission. We're the agent. And perhaps people have began to reject the church because we've made the church the goal. When God never intended the church to be the goal, God or Jesus intended his church to be the agent, the vehicle through which his kingdom comes. And so let's not try and get rid of the church. Let's adjust the church according to how God intended it, getting us and her focused back on the mission and the mandate and the kingdom. But the vehicle will never change. We are the agent, not the goal of his mission, meaning that the church does not send. We don't send people. We've got to live sent. We are sent. The church is sent, and uh, meaning we're inherently missional, right? The church is not a place. The church is a people, and we are a sent people. So let's live accordingly to whatever that looks like going forward. The next thing that is unchanging, and this is our model, our model. And what I mean by that is this apostolic prophetic model. It's right through Scripture. It's actually Old Covenant. It's in the beginning. It's the, it's the, the mandate given to Adam and Eve was to multiply and be fruitful and go and subdue and take the world and all that. 
And, uh, and so, sorry, there's a fly running around here. But anyway, it's, uh, we'll carry on with it. I hope you can put up with the noise. I can't get rid of it. But anyway, um, we, we, gonna, we say, so it, it's, it's, what was I, I was saying, the model is from the beginning God intended. Abraham was sent. God may, uh, go and be a blessing to all nations. It's right through the Old Covenant and certainly right into the New Testament, New Covenant. Going and sending. It's not an NCMI thing, man. I'm so tired. Forgive me for my honesty today. I'm tired of people saying it's an NCMI thing. It's a God thing. Apostolic prophetic is God's way. There is no alternative. There's no other uh, Christianity you can find in Scripture. We are a apostolic prophetic people. We're a going and sending people. We're a seeing and preparing and becoming the future people. And so that model, that, that, that model of apostolic prophetic must never change. The way it's worked out always changes, but that heart cannot change if we are shaping and reshaping something of that future church, of the, the church that God has intended us to be going forward. The next thing is uh, what doesn't change is the manual. And it's not my manuals or Dudley's manuals or your books or my. We all have those things and we write them to be helpful, but that's not the mesh, That's not our manual. Our manual is the Word of God. Friends, the Word of God. I know I'm stating obvious things, but the concern I have in our dreaming of a future church is putting aside Scripture and let's get busy with our things that really matter. No, no. Part of what we've gone through is God brought us back to His Word. And looking back to Scripture and stopping all the podcasts and the books and the, the Google info and coming back to God's Word. God's not watching over my words or yours, my declaration. He's watching over His Word to see His Word fulfilled. And if we're going to build a future church and shape it, it better be the Word of God, backed by Scripture, everything we emphasize and say. Uh, Psalm 119 verse 89 says, Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. If it's settled in heaven forever, well, then it's settled here on earth forever too. And so it's, it's very prophetic. It, it, it's, it's, it lasts forever. And we just got to keep coming back to the wonder of the word of God. And friends, may it be a mirror, as we keep saying, as well as a lens. May we live it out, not just preach it. But let's make sure everything we highlight must be biblically backed, especially if we're going to build this church and shape a church for generations to come. They will fail. It will fail miserably if it's put up, put done in our revelation, latest books, latest understanding, rather than the Word of God. There can be no more radical church than a church that is Bible-based at every level. And so that is our word, and the word of God never changes. Also, what never changes is the ministers, the ministers, and what I mean is the priesthood. If we've learned anything in this lockdown, shutdown, is that God's not going to let a handful of leaders do it all. He wants all people, His priests, to be priests. And I think priesthood of all believers is a great concept for many of us, but it hasn't been a great reality on how the church should function. And so God has wonderfully in this moment forced leaders not to be able to do it all again. And now we've got the, the true priests, the priesthood of all believers rising up and ministering. And, and I want to say, let's not be quick to take that back. If we're building for a local future church, it's going to be all hands on deck, all people working, all people walking in their call, all needed to do what is tasked, one body, many parts, all the, the scriptures that talk about that. They have to become more real for the future church God has intended. And I'm just telling you, it's not going to be a handful of leaders. It's going to be a bunch of God's people, no names, no branding, just people saying yes to God, being faithful. And that's what we've got to build towards and empower those people and raise them up and strengthen and give them courage to go and be it and not permission, but endorsing them and going for it. And it's Let's take the world in this season. Uh, another thing that's unchanging is our need to multiply. We are called to multiply. And multiplication is not an optional extra. It's not one thing we get to. It's what we call to. we got to multiply. So everything we're doing has to be viewed with this thing of multiplication, bringing more. Friends, it's not somewhere when we get big we can stop multiplying. Multiply one right now. Keep multiplying. That's not up for change. That is more back to keep multiplying. And the Bible's very clear around that. And the last thing, again, there's many more, but I want to just highlight one more thing that shouldn't change is the fact that we're called to mature and grow up. I think, again, what COVID has exposed is that how immature the church has been 
And I think a 12 months of lockdown has been far more effective in maturing us than 12 months of us getting together and having more meetings. And, that. and that's a bit of a slap in our faces, to be honest. But what it does mean is we better get better at fa focusing on maturing people rather than just blessing them and giving them our latest, greatest, next revelation, writing our new books. We are called to prepare the bride for the return of Jesus. So maturity is the end result. It's the goal that God's given us. And we need to raise up a people for that. So maturity. Jesus is coming back for us. So let's grow up and let's look for a church. So that's not up for debate. That is stuff we're going after. What's going to help mature the bride? Equipping and maturing her, Ephesians 4. Uh, those gifts were given by Christ to the church for the church to equip her, but also to bring her to a place of maturity, becoming more like Jesus. So those are not up for grabs. All right, what I think must change what I think and believe must change is a few things. I mean, there's many more, but just for time's sake, let me give you a few I, I've, I've been processing through is how we measure success. <laughs> how we measure success. And, uh, you know, the problem is that every church or every believer uses something to measure success. And here's the problem. Whatever we choose to use or measure success, it does two things. It, it reveals our culture, but it also reinforces our culture of our lives or our churches and I, I think we've had to really look at what is mature i mean what is success and uh we've taken worldly perspective and made that kingdom and i think that we're in danger going forward of trying to get back to the bigness and the the numbers and the income and, and those things matter but they're not true success we've got to as the church unfolds into this great future we got to contend for for the things he spoke, but we've also got to change the way we measure success. Please, my dear friends, let's not allow flesh or worldly things to determine what true success is. I've said this many times. We count success, but God weighs success. How much of Jesus is in what we're doing, not how much of what you have is yours, in a sense. And and so, you know, the early church, if you look at their hearts, it seems they, they weren't that enamored with size. They were more kind of enamored with reach. I think there's a big difference. We want to have big, but not big for the sake of big. We want to reach. We need a greater reach. And that's something I, I think that's going to help us live in the mission God has and the stuff we say that doesn't change going forward when we come back to understanding what, how we measure success. So the challenge is for all of us to take that and say, well, what does that mean for us as a local church or even individuals? And let's go after kingdom success, not worldly success. Otherwise, we're going to miss the thing God has for us. And another thing that must change is our motives. Our motives. Uh, we, we unfortunately do many things in the name of God, in the name of Christ, in the name of the church, but for the wrong motives. And Man, I just feel like God's got a hold of our hearts saying, actually, everything should be done again for the love and the glory of God. If it's for anything else, it's the wrong motive, guys. And again, I know we can say, well, Paul said, as long as Christ preached, I don't care. No, no. We actually need to be motivated by the right things. All that's done, all that's said. I feel like God's got major doors for some of us watching this. And, but it's coming back to the motive. Do you want the recognition or you just want to give the glory to God? Paul was very clear, even in his writing, 1 Corinthians, that God doesn't choose the wise and he brings the foolish to shame the wise. Why is that? He says, so that no flesh may glory in his presence. No man can take the glory for anything. And I do sense if we settle that again and again and our motives are not to be recognized and put my hand up in my ministry, my church, my success, just I do what I do for the glory of God. Man, friends, that church going forward can be spectacular and truly bring glory to God. I think what also needs to change is our modus operandi. And again, we're using words just to keep with alliteration here. But, you know, the ways of God, they're organic, friends. They're, there is spirit life that needs to come back. And that's not, not having banks. I'm not just saying let's just be led by the Spirit. Well, I, I do think we need banks, but we need river. We need the river. We really do. And somehow we forgot that the banks are there to actually uh, uh, direct the river. Banks without a river is just a big hole. It's a dry hole. Um, and I think the church, unfortunately, can be like it if we're not spirit-led and spirit-driven and there's this organic nature to what we're being called to. We've got to get more. While there's organization needed, we're an organic people. The church is organic, and we need the ways of God and the strategies of God to change and adjust going forward, but the creative ways. And so, 
you know, the, the, the spirit without, or the river without banks is a marsh. So we need both. But some of us are like so big on ways that we don't allow the life. And let's look for life. Let's, let's follow the life of God through the banks, through Scripture. Let's see what God's doing. Now, even now, like what's God doing and where's their life? Where's the life of God? Go with some of that in the context of the purpose and plans of God. Another thing that is linked to this that must change is our methods and our methodology. This to me is the biggest thing that needs to change. Somehow we've made methods the theology or methods the way to do it. I think the church globally has all been trying to do everything exactly the same way. That's why the life of God is gone. And I think shaping the future of the church, there are the methods and methodology is up for grabs. The way we do things has to change. Uh, even our gatherings and what we do in our gatherings, not for the sake of change, for the sake of effectiveness and to fulfill the mission. We've got to change. And it's not three songs and an illustration and a sermon and a preach. And a, I'm not against that, but I feel like the whole world's doing that and it's not even affecting the, world, the, the people we're called to reach. And so... The, the freedom I'm challenging us with, and I feel God's challenge, is there's freedom in the season to find new ways, new methods. God forbid that we back to the 80s again, or, or the next generation has to in, uh, implement our methodology and our ways because we weren't available or willing to adjust. Our methods must change. If we settle what doesn't change, then we've got to find new ways, new methods. And so... It was someone said the idolatry of method is what kept Moses out of the promised land. Think about that. The promised land, the provision of God, the future God had for Moses, it was the meth, uh, the the idolatry of method that uh, that kept him out of the promised land. Let's not be kept out of the promises because of methods. Let's find ways. There's freedom in God. God's I think okay with us doing things differently, not to be different, to be more effective going forward and whatever that means. Another quick thing that needs to change is our self sufficient mentality. My goodness, friends, we are so quick to take things on and take responsibility and again get back to doing things without God. And I don't judge our hearts. I just think we're good at doing what we do and we're just gonna have to keep changing this mentality. We're not self-sufficient. We cannot do a thing without God. And that will help us stick to His plan and give Him the glory if we keep with, our, with His being fully sufficient, uh, being totally dependent on Him rather than being self-sufficient with our thinking. And, mental. and linked to that is our mindsets that must change, this pragmatic approach. We can't approach the future God has for us pragmatically. We've got to lead with the future in mind. What does it look like? All the stuff we're putting in place. It's going to shape the future of the church. So don't do it pragmatically. We can't be pleasing people. This is a mindset that has to shift. We choose whether we please man or God. And he can't do both according to Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. And Paul said, if I was still trying to win the approval of man, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. We've got to settle. Are we going to please people or are we going to please God? But I'm telling you, if we're going to build a church for the future that shapes the way God intended for generation. It's going to have to come back to pleasing God, not man. A.W. Tozer said, a church that cannot worship must be entertained. And that's tragic. And we've seen that even entertaining through this season. Let's not entertain. Let's engage God's people and get on with fulfilling what God has for us. Someone said, if we're not, if we're not seeking the glory of God, we're depending on the affirmation of men. That's a dangerous thing in leadership and in uh, going forward. Let's not look for affirmation of man. Let's look for the depending on God's glory and God's glory alone. Another thing that must change is our impatience. <laughs> we could stay further, but don't be impatient through seasons if we are building and shaping a church for the future. Another thing is our worldly perspectives. We've got to come back to renewed mind and think kingdom, not worldly and so on. Another thing is pursuing the wrong things. Again, I think that's going to get us into trouble. When we begin to pursue the wrong things, this is still part of just being this. These are uh, our mindsets that need to change. Uh, pursuing the wrong things. One of the things I, I realize more and more is the devil desires to destroy us, but he's only been given the power to distract us. So the way he destroys us is by distracting us. And so don't let the upkeep of the church ever distract us from advancing the kingdom of God, friends. And I think in this season, it's so easy to that to happen. But as we as we are shaping a future church, the church God intended for generations to come let's not get distracted in a season pursue the right things and no personal revelation is another thing we need to be begging god to reveal himself daily to us we can't live on borrowed revelation or what others think about jesus we've got to have our own revelation and that's going to help us build 
for the next generation. So just in landing, I want to just say, what are some of the reasons our churches or the church or our ministries won't adjust or have the impact God intended? Well, these are going to hurt a little there and step on your toes, but I feel like in light of just go with me, the scripture we read, Psalm 32, 8 and 9, we're going to have to just adjust. Some of the reasons that will stop us or str- we struggle to impact going forward, well, I think number one is we're the measure of our choices. We make choices for the future just based on us or how we feel. I've watched that, and I want to tell you it's an incredibly dangerous thing. We allow our capacity to determine the future call of the church rather than the call to determine our capacity. Don't do that, friends. Let's let God enlarge us into His call rather than we get in the way and we make ourselves the decision makers for the future God is building. So it's so easy to do in leadership as elders or people or leaders to just... Make decisions based on us, but we can't if we're building for the future. Another reason is we're not willing to make tough decisions or tough calls and or choices. And I feel coming out of the season, we've got some tough decisions to make, tough calls, and we're going to make the right choices for the future, not for the history or for the now. And if we're not willing to do that, I think we're going to lose the impact and not be the church that God's intended. Another thing is we're not able to embrace change. Change is here to stay. We've learned that. We see that. But more change, continued change. Uh, if you're not willing to embrace change, I think we're going to miss out and we won't be the people of God. Our current situation is another thing. I think some are losing their way, studying obvious things. But if we're, not, if we're allowing our current situation to determine the future of the church, man, we're in trouble. And we're not going to have the impact long-lasting and live in the shape of the next era of the church Jesus is building. If we're in constant conflict, and we are in a battle, we talked about that last session, but the battle is sometimes within, and we've got to stop fighting each other. I think we've got to fight for unity. We've got to sort stuff out and work stuff out. And Psalm 133 talks about where, pe- where bro- brothers live together, dwell together, not have moments of being together. They live in the harmony and unity. God commands. this commanded blessing and life. And all the stuff we're crying out for, God commands that where there is blessing. So fight for unity. At the same time, we've got to fight for diversity. A lot of us think unity means everyone has to be the same act. No, no. Unity is, is, is settled in who Christ is and our functioning in the purposes of God. But diversity is God's way for us all to function differently. And we, the stronger, the more diverse we are, the more stronger we are. So unity is not diversity. So as much as we need to fight for unity, we need to fight for diversity. And we see that in Ephesians chapter 4. Another thing we've got to fight for is that each other. Fight for each other. We're not co-workers. We're co-laborers. We need each other. And lastly, fight for our mission. My friends, bored soldiers, we're in a battle. And, and bored soldiers are dangerous. They end up fighting each other. We're made for mission. If we're not on mission individually and collective, we'll find ways to damage each other. So conflict within is going to stop us being that church Another thing is no charisma. We fake. We judgmental. We hypocritical. We angry. We narrow-minded. We unkind. Those things will stop us being the people God's called us to be, and certainly building a church, the church, His church, for generations to come. Let's find ways to build each other up and not be narrow-minded and angry and yeah. Anyway, don't be a jerk. We don't want jerks in the kingdom. We want kingdom people who are people want to be with and whatever that looks like. And lastly, you've, we've lost our conviction. I, I feel like if we lose our conviction, we're going to lose everything. And I think many guys get so focused on growth that they're actually no longer focused on God. And I think for the future generations, we've got to focus on God and we've got to not lose conviction, live and lead with conviction. So I, I know I've landed. Here's my third landing, finished landing. Quick questions that would be good to answer. And again, not get all the answers, just to help us go forward. I think these are some far-reaching questions that I've heard others and maybe God's shown me and just good questions to ask, not to doubt, but to be preparing for the future God has. Far-reaching questions to help us lead forward vision and structure to fit the new era that God has taken us into. Here are some. Is our, struggle li- is, is our structure life-giving or is it smothering? It's a good question to ask. And be careful who you ask. If it's people who are feeling always like there's never, just be careful, all right? Don't, don't fight, just settle some things in your heart. But is our structure life-giving or smothering? Another one is our current plan and strategy delivering the results God's called us to. It's worth looking at. 
I mean, if it's not working, let's change it up. It's a good time to change things up. We, if the good question is, if we're starting again with our current people, our current income, what would we do differently? That's a good question to ask. Ask this question: What is not working? <laughs> And then ask, why haven't we stopped these things? If your horse is dead, well, for goodness sake, dismount. Get off your horse. Uh, it's time to reshape, redefine, and prune away some of these things. Another question is, are our priorities truly biblical? Or are we experiencing missional drift? And again, we've talked about what shouldn't change. Another one is, are, are we too dependent on copying what others are doing? And I have addressed this. Or are we doing what God's called us to do? I think another thing is, are we being, which follows it, are we being authentic to the calling of the church or the people we've been called to reach? Be authentic. Another one is, are we, are, are, where are the signs of God's favor and fruit most evident? Another one is, are our, this is a big one, friends, are our external partnerships, and I want to talk a little bit about partnership in the next session, but are our external partnerships and relationships with apostolic prophetic up to date? Are they real? Are they relevant? And are they where we are today? That's important. Are they real? It's cool to say we partner with a team called NCMI and have no input, no perspective, no real accountability. I think we need that if we're going to truly go forward in the season. It's good to ask those questions. We've got the right people we're working with. Even though we connect to this big team, who are the guys that speak into our lives and our churches? And It's a good question. Another question is, are we building an empire for our own ego or are we truly building God's kingdom? And here's the thing is, does our language, our planning, our metrics, our measurements, and our budget reflect that, not our ego or our own thing? Another thing is, are, are we innovating? Are we simply repeating ministry patterns from memory? I think God wants to show us some new ways, new strategies, and so on. Another thing is, how could we reach and transform our entire region for Jesus quickly? That's a great question. Here's the thing, if Jesus was returning in three months, what would you do to reach those people around you in that time? Those are some good questions to ask. What are our limitations? What are our weaknesses? How are we fixing or working around them and so on? Another thing is, are we doing all we can to raise up the next generation? All we can. Not thinking about it, praying about it, doing it. Are we doing all we can to raise up? How can we talk about the shape of a future church if we're not raising up the next generation? In saying that, are we valuing the older among us and harnessing their great wisdom and experience and stability? Use them together if we're building for the future. Another question is, are we growing by reaching unsaved people? How much growth is coming by reaching those who are lost? That's a big measurement of the future church we're building. If it's about just keeping saved people saved, we're missing the impact God has for us. Let me ask you this challenge. Is, are all the elements of the early church in the book of Acts allowed, celebrated, encouraged, and as I said, allowed to thrive among us? If there's a no to that, we're going to miss what God's doing going forward. And I think it's a thing we've got to come back to again and again. Quickly, a couple more. Is our entire concept of church fully biblical? <laughs> Man, it's worth re-looking at that. Are we truly representing Jesus and becoming more like Him? That's a major question to be continually answered. For me, I'll leave us with this last question. To me, that's still the most important. Is Are we loving Him with our yes and with our obedience? I can't picture a church that Jesus is building and the shape of the church to truly reflect Him and represent Him if we're not fully obeying Him and loving Him with our yes. The church has no future if we're not saying yes to Jesus, if we're not hearing Him. And so, friends, what a time, what a season. Challenged, absolutely. Encourage, you bet. But what a time to relook and reshape something of what that church future could be. And I don't think we have to worry about the shape of the church. I think we've got to worry about what matters and watch that church become more and more real, more relevant and more reflecting Jesus Christ. So I trust that, again, is not new, but it challenges us, encourages us. I ask you please to go ask these questions. Let's work through this rather than just hear it. And let's go and be the people God's called us to be, to set His church up for the finest hour and for His return. God bless you. Thanks for your time. Appreciate you guys. Take care.